Our college network technology 221 introduction to networks. I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. We'll be covering chapter one, exploring the network. Our objectives is that you'll be able to explain how multiple networks are used in everyday life, explain the topologies and devices used in a small to medium sized business network, explain the basic characteristics of a network that supports communication in a small to medium sized business, and explain trends in networking that will affect the use of networks in small to medium sized businesses. These are the sections. Um, these come straight from your online textbook, your ebook for this class. The basic uh, idea here with this slide is to illustrate that we've had a huge growth in the internet more and more users. But what's been happening is a transition away from fixed computing. That would be the traditional box um, that sat on or under a desk and um, was known as the computer. That device has gotten smaller, lighter, battery powered, and that becomes mobile. So we've started to carry phones that are really a handheld computer with a phone application on them. And we're moving into an area of Internet of Things, where the Internet will be baked into everyday appliances like your refrigerator, uh, your light bulbs, your security system in your home, if you have a home security system, your vehicle, your automobile, your infotainment system, and your automobile is often now linked to the Internet. And we'll move from there by 2020 with 50 billion new devices on the network, we will be putting the internet in everything in terms of our processes, our thinking, everything that we do, the way we collaborate and live our lives will be connected to the internet. This is an actual product that Cisco makes. This is a virtual conference room. And so if you look closely at this picture, it's actually half a of a mahogany table. The other half is at a remote location. Those are actually just TV screens back there uh, projecting the other half of the table. So there's, if you went in this room, there's actually just a, uh, a white wall at the other, other half of the table. So this is the way that you could have, uh, and you could actually have, see those three screens, those could actually be three separate remote sites linking four different sites to gather into a single meeting um, experience. And so this is a, a one of many examples of new technologies that the internet is allowing to make possible, mainly having meetings uh, with folks at different geographic locations and allowing to bring them together. So networks are supporting the way we learn, evidenced by this uh, recorded lecture you're watching here, or our e-classroom or the e-book, all of these um, network capabilities make it more flexible for you to learn. It changes the way we communicate. Today, people will often use Facebook, text messages. There's a variety of communications available. Instead of back in the day, it was just the telephone or you sent a letter. Um, and now we have, we still have those, but we have many other ways that we can communicate with folks. It changes the way we work and the way we play. So most homes now have a small home network in them. Somewhere in the home, there is a, a small router or modem that uh, brings the internet into the home space. And you'll find that most small offices are also on the internet. Uh, obviously, medium and large companies are definitely on the internet. And we connect all these three together to create what we call worldwide networks, which is just a linkage of all of our networks into one global network we call the internet. In networks, we typically have clients and servers. A client is a device um, that is the recipient and source, so the source and destination of information. So if you want to think of it like a restaurant, you would clients would be the patrons that come in the restaurant and they look over the menu and they, they request things, they order items. They also give things, uh, usually money or a credit card. And um, the server, is the entity that takes and brings those um, requested items to and from the client. And so a server provides an orderly, organized way that the resources within the restaurant are distributed. And that's the same way in a network that we use servers. We have some servers will store files, some servers will manage printing, some manage email, um, some manage your internet access. 
and then the clients request these resources and the server um, ensures the resources are distributed in an orderly way. Peer-to-peer -peer networking is a less formal way we could build a network without a server. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, you just share with your peers whatever you want. You might share your printer with um, another device on your network. You might share a file or a folder. The problems with peer-to-peer -peer networking is there's no centralized server, so you can't really manage it in a larger environment. So it's not scalable. It's also not near as secure. We have a lot of security problems when we just informally uh, exchange information and it can have a real impact on performance. Usually this type of sharing is very slow um, performance wise, but it's easy to set up and you wouldn't have to go through a network administrator and have a big meeting about how to set up your printers or your files. You could just set it up yourself in a few minutes and it costs almost nothing because this type of networking is built into every Windows operating system. Components of a network. We have three components. There's three categories that we put all the things that involve a network, all the things, the items you can see and touch. They're either devices, devices are physical items. Um, you know, the, they are the devices of the network. The examples would be printers and uh, phones and PCs and servers and switches and routers and all the devices and then connecting those devices together are the cables and when study cables we call that media that could be radio frequency media uh, it could be cellular then or it could be wi-fi it could be copper media so a t1 or a, a phone line or ethernet or it could even be fiber optic media so technologies like uh, fiddy and um, uh, sonnet and things like that and then we have the services. Services would be things like email or file sharing or printer sharing. Some examples of end devices. So now that we look at devices, remember those three categories, devices, media, and services. Within devices, we have different types of devices. One type of device is called the end device. Some examples would be your computers, network printers, phones, um, Telepresence, that's that slide I showed with the Cisco Conference Center that's at two places. That's called telepresence, where you can basically create a virtual meeting room across a distance. Security cameras are often now linked to the internet, so um, even your phones, uh, tablets, PDAs, a um, credit card machine, a barcode scanner, there are many types of end devices. Another type of device is called the network infrastructure device. These are devices that are not at the ends of the network, they're in the middle. And their job is to move, they're really the postal, the postal people of the network. The infrastructure devices are the routers and the switches and the hubs and the wireless access points, your firewalls. And their job is really not to be the recipient or the sender of data, they're the intermediary. And so they help move the data along as it moves along towards a destination. So they help sources and destinations receive and send data. Now let's look at some media. I alluded to this already. There's three broad categories of media. We have copper, fiber optic, and wireless. Here are the different types of end devices. End devices could be laptops, printers, uh, telephones, computers, and intermediary devices, routers, switches, firewalls. We have two different types of topologies that we will create. We can create a physical topology, that is a drawing of where everything is physically located within a building or a campus. And so we would actually have to draw each little device and show how the wires come out of each device, where they go through the building to connect to all the other devices. That's called a physical topology. That helps someone install a network and maintain the physical wiring of a network. And then if you look in the right side of the illustration here, that's a drawing of the same network, but that's a logical topology. A logical topology has no relation to where things are physically located. Instead, it shows how information is exchanged between devices. 
In a logical topology, we usually don't show the individual devices. We show the groups of devices. We're trying to show how information moves between one group and another. So in the logical topology, you can see how the different departments and classrooms are exchanging information through the router firewall and how they get to and from the internet. If you wanted to know how they were individually cabled as specific devices, I would have to refer to the physical topology diagram. We have several different types of networks. The two common ones are LAN and WAN. A LAN or local area network is the ethernet network within your building. So that would be the network you have inside your home. It's the network inside your office and inside a company walls. Interlinking LANs are WANs. WANs are the wireless networks. This is the network you pay for when you call up Comcast or Verizon or CenturyLink and you set yourself up with a T1 or a DSL or a DOCSIS, which is cable modem. And those are called WANs. And WANs are a link between LANs. It links one LAN to another. They're the roadways or pathways between them. We have some other types of networks that are within LAN and WAN. So there's only two broad types, LAN and WAN. But within a WAN, we have several different types of WANs. We might have a MAN, a metropolitan area network. That's a WAN that exists within a city limit. So uh, downtown Portland, if you had two buildings in downtown Portland, you might connect them with a WAN link, which is a particular type of WAN called a MAN or metropolitan area network. Typically, these are higher speed, they're faster fiber optic networks that are run under the streets within a city and are not always available at longer distances. Say if you had an office in Portland and another office in Los Angeles, you probably could not get the same type of connectivity um, in your WAN that you could if both your offices were in the same city. And that's why we differentiate uh, WAN connections within a city as a metropolitan area network. Similarly, we also often call out a wireless LAN. A wireless LAN or WLAN is simply a local area network, the type of network you have in your home or office, but most of us in our homes at least have moved to a wireless LAN. They're cheaper, we don't have to run wires all over our home. Our homes usually didn't come with ethernet cabling and so we find a wireless LAN a very convenient and affordable way to build a network. Storage area networks, that's a type of LAN where you put special servers that store your information. We often want to keep this information more secure and more controlled, so we'll put it in its own isolated network called a storage area network. Here's a look at how some of these networks look. A local area network would just be, again, like in your home or in a small office. Here's a WAN. The WANs in the middle, notice it is simply the link between two LANs. A WAN simply connects two or more LANs together. A WAN might be a couple hundred feet long, it might be several miles or kilometers, or it might span around the entire globe. Like the internet. The internet is simply the collection of a whole bunch of LANs and WANs all cabled together. The collective group of all the LANs and their interconnecting WANs is referred to as the internet. Here is a look then at the internet in the outer, that's the large internet. Within the internet, you can create extranets. Extranets are a network that a company creates to allow select outside groups to access their network. That might be their customers or suppliers or collaborators. So if you have an account at a, um, at a bank and you log into your um, bank online, that's an extranet. And so they're allowing their customers to log into their network um, externally. An intranet is only available to the employees within that company only. So typically only available in, in the offices that they work and sometimes uh, through special secure connections from the employees' homes. And that's called an intranet. It wouldn't be uh, available to the customers or to anyone else in the, in the world. Let's take a look at different internet access technologies. There are many ways that we can um, access the internet today. Uh, DSL, cable, cellular, satellite, and still the phone line 
are the predominant ways that we're going to find a connection. There are many others, but the main ones are listed here. Here are some others. You could, if you were a larger company, purchase a dedicated leased line. This is a piece of fiber optic or copper cabling that you lease. It's borrowed from the phone company and you pay a monthly fee and it's yours and only yours and it's a direct piece of physical cabling that you, that you are uh, leasing. Just like you might lease a car or a building, it's yours and only yours and you can run any kind of speed you want over it. With uh, Metro Ethernet, we talked about Metro Nets. Those are networks within a city. Um, a certain type of WAN called a, a MAN, a Metro Area Network, um, a MAN is able to provide higher speeds, often through Ethernet, DSL, satellite. The converging network. We say a network is converged because we've put all of our different types of data together. So all networks today are pretty much converged networks. Uh, traditionally, computer networks only carried email and documents, file uploads and downloads. They didn't carry voice or video. So a converged network simply means that we are carrying voice and video and traditional computer data on the same wires, on the same network. And so there are extra complexities with doing that when we want to put all this type of traffic on the same network. But um, that's what a converge or converging network is. And we have that today. So usually today um, we have all of our networks converged where we can send emails and watch videos and talk on a voice over IP phone call all at the same time on the same wire. But networks are moving into a new area called intelligent networks, right? where intelligent networks bring the data that you want to you without you necessarily having to ask for it. And you can see this on a lot of the mobile phones that can make um, uh, say recommendations about where to eat based on looking at some GPS data and the time of the day, they might say, you know, it's going to be about lunchtime and I'm going to go ahead and present my users some restaurants that are within walking distance or whatever of, of a particular area. And you can customize these search capabilities. You can do this right now in an Android or an Apple phone. And a lot of these are coming to um, to our computer systems where they make intelligent decisions about the data that we would like to have and they group that data for us. Other things that we look at when we're building networks is fault tolerance. That's the ability for a network to survive outages. So if a piece of equipment fails, will the network fall apart or will it be tolerant of the failure? And that's what fault tolerance means. And it's up to us, the network administrators and the designers of the network to build networks that have fault tolerance, which typically means running additional cabling and purchasing extra equipment that allows the network to continue to operate when, when something fails. Scalability is our ability to build networks that can grow in size and complexity without having to redo the whole thing. So usually they're fairly modular where we can add on in a modular way to our network and scale or increase its size and complexity. Quality of service is the idea that we have that converged network, that we have voice, that we have video, and that we have traditional data services all on the same wire, but they require different qualities of service. For instance, if you're in a voice phone call, it's not very tolerant of delay you really need to get the voice signal to the other end very quickly so that it appears to be a real-time communication. Where if you were sending an email, it doesn't matter if the email waits around for 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds. It, it's not gonna make any impact on the quality of, of that email. What's more important with the email is that you get every single bit there. Emails are very um, un intolerant of loss. You can't lose any of the bits or the email's no good. You'd have to resend the whole thing. So there are different qualities of service for different types of data. And so understanding the different types of data that travel across our network and what they really need, what type of service do they need, um, that helps us understand uh, how we're going to build and design our networks. And the newest one is security. How do we lock it down? How do we keep people out of our network that shouldn't be in there? How do we stop bad things from happening, data from being corrupted or destroyed or stolen? 
So this would be a look at fault tolerance, and you can see here we've added some additional switches to the network. So if any one of the switches fails, um, we will have redundancy in the switches. But notice the endpoints are not redundant. So if we have an endpoint failure, or for instance, if we were to fail one of the two switches that these phones are connected to, we'd be out of luck. So really, only three of the switches can fail in this uh, diagram. Um, and we could still be redundant. There are two switches and two phones that are not redundant. And so fault tolerance doesn't always mean everything's redundant. Think about the spare tire in your car. That ensures that if you have a, a tire blowout, that you have a spare and can continue to travel on your journey. But we don't usually have a spare engine or a spare transmission, and so not everything is fault tolerant. We typically will fault tolerant only some of the equipment, and usually that's because of a financial limitation. And, and a, uh, it becomes unreasonable and, and un, uncapable to build a fully fault tolerant network. Some networks that are fully fault tolerant would be a 911 call center. They typically 911 call centers will have three of everything. Every call center employee has three phones, three computers, and three network connections going to three separate servers. And so by building things in triplicate, we can have a double failure anywhere in the network and continue to run our, our operations. But that is untypical because of the high cost and, and the high uh, complexity, which adds to cost in maintaining that system, we, we wouldn't normally do that. If you look at anyone's office area, they would only have one phone and one computer, for instance. And if their computer fails, then they are unable to do their work. So typically, we would add the redundancy somewhere in the middle of the network where, uh, where it makes the most sense. So this is a packet switch network, and we're able to switch packets through this network and then change the um, direction and the path that the packets take. So packet switch networks don't have a fixed path that they follow. They are routed down a path at the time they are sent, much like an envelope through the postal system. This allows the routers to make uh, different path decisions on a moment by moment basis and really load balance these links and provide better utilization of the wiring. They can also work around outages. If there is an outage, if a cable comes out or fails, the routers are able to choose a new path for the remaining packets to travel. Okay, scalable networks. Um, scalability is the ability to build things in a hierarchical modular fashion. And so uh, the whole internet is built this way. We have ISPs that are in different tiers. You can see that tier one ISPs would be the highest level when they provide the backbone to the internet. They then sell internet service to tier two ISPs. And then tier two ISPs sell that service down to local ISPs. So Comcast would be an example of a local ISP or a tier two ISP. They actually buy their internet from a um, company called Level 3, and Level 3 is a tier one ISP. Sprint is also a tier one ISP. Many other internet providers that you're buying service through, like perhaps your DSL, you might buy DSL through CenturyLink, they're buying their internet off of Sprint. And so most of your local ISPs are not themselves directly connected to the internet. So through this hierarchy, we're able to modularly add to the complexity of our networks. Providing quality of service. So that might be time sensitive communication like I mentioned to you in my example earlier. You might have something like a phone call that's bi-directional and you really need to get those packets across the network very quickly because they're time sensitive. They can't afford to be delayed very long or playing them becomes ridiculous because the end user is listening to them in real time. They're being played immediately uh, upon arrival. And so if we delay the arrival very much, it's going to mess up the sequence or the, um, the, the sound quality of that communication. We also have non-time sensitive communication. That would be like a file download, an email, that kind of thing. We also have high importance. Things we'll prioritize. So we might have certain communications 
um, like a router table update. That if that router table update doesn't get through, nothing else will get through because it's an update about new information about the network paths that the routers need to function. And so we'll uh, assign them a high importance, kind of like an ambulance. When an ambulance or a police car has its lights on, all the other vehicles move over for it. High importance traffic usually gets a priority. They get to go right to the front of the line. So when there's congestion on the network, they're able to move through the network uh, fairly quickly. Unlike the congested traffic, they're able to jump to the front of the line at these congested interfaces. We also have undesirable communication. These are things we typically don't want to allow, or if we do allow them, it says it's on an as available basis. If there's bandwidth left over, we'll allow them to operate. And this might be things like uh, watching Netflix or doing peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, sometimes peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is called BitTorrent. So any of these kind of low priority things, we'll either block them as inappropriate and unwanted or we'll deprioritize them saying, yeah, we'll allow this, but only after everything else has gone through the interface. So in times of congestion, we're not going to allow this type of undesirable communication. So that's what we do as admins. We have to decide what's priority, what's undesirable, and everything in between. And then now moving on to security, another admin job is to secure the network to make sure that all of these identity thieves, criminals, cheats, competitors, and fraudsters stay out of our network. And there are a variety of ways we do that. Access policies, firewalls, and data encryption are some of the main ones. Now, new trends in networking, uh, one is bring your own device or BYOD. The phenomenon here is that many employees are now wanting to use their personal device on the employer network. And that in the past in a traditional network setting was not allowed. For instance, here at Clark College, employees like myself are not allowed to use our personal devices on the uh, college network. However, they allow students to use their devices on the network. So that's an example of moving towards bring your own device. As, um, as companies allow employees and customers to use their own devices on the employee network, that has its own complications and security concerns that have to be addressed. Also, there's a big trend towards online collaboration. Instead of everyone driving and uh, getting a room and ordering lunch and coming in and having a big meeting, more and more folks are using tools like Skype and video conference and collaboration products to be able to work online. Sometimes that's just doing a conference call. Video. Boy, using YouTube to learn how to do something or this video I'm making for you as a video lecture, that's the new way that a lot of um, content is being delivered in terms of trainings, uh, informational uh, pieces and all kinds of that sort of thing. Uh, it's not uncommon now to buy a new device or piece of equipment and it doesn't come with a big heavy user manual. It usually comes with a getting started guide that's one or two pages long and usually then refers you to videos at the end that you can watch on the company website for more information. I bought a new car stereo for instance and um, put it in my car and the car stereo directed me to um, Pioneer, the company that made the radio, uh, for videos on how to set it up and do everything. It wasn't provided in the, in the uh, um, printed documentation. I had to go to the internet and watch a few videos to learn how to use my new car stereo. So a lot of uh, video is being made. Cisco CEO John Chambers estimates that by 2020, 80% of the internet bandwidth will be uh, utilized for video. So video is a big emerging uh, trend. And then cloud computing. This is the idea that you're no longer storing things on your hard drive, but you're storing them on a hard drive somewhere in the cloud, somewhere, somewhere out there. Uh, there are many cloud products, and we use cloud services all the time if you have a mobile phone, if you have an iPhone or an Android phone. Chances are your contacts, um, your photographs, and many of your information on that phone are actually not stored on the phone, or if they are, they are synchronized to cloud storage. Data centers is what makes a lot of this stuff happen. And when you go into our lab, that's actually a fully functioning data center. And a data center is just a whole bunch of servers in a room with a whole bunch of routers and switches and redundant systems. We have a lot of redundant power supplies, 
look closely at the ceiling next time and you're in the lab and you will see all these power outlets hanging out of the ceiling. And you will also see, if you ask, we will show you the batteries that are stacked in there that provide battery backup in case the power goes out, our key systems are kept running for four hours on big batteries. We also have different environmental controls. You will see the air conditioning systems and the fire suppression systems. And we also have security devices. And if you ask us, we'd be happy to show you all of these parts of our data center right where you're working in class every day. So the cloud is really a data center somewhere that you're accessing across the internet. One way that they're innovatively getting the internet to some people's homes today is through the power lines. Yes, you can actually deliver internet connections across a power line. They're doing this in some select areas in the country and that's a modem that you buy a little um, power line router that you can plug into any outlet in your home that you want to get internet at. And it's a great way to move the internet throughout your house without having to run network cabling. Wireless broadband. So with wireless broadband, uh, many of us will use this. It, it's got several different names from clear to 3G or 4G. Uh, wireless broadband is the ability of, of uh, being able to get your internet across the cellular service. Network security, big, big um, concern today is protecting computers from external threats. But wait, we also have internal threats. It's a smaller concern, but we have to be aware that our own employees and maybe not of their own volition, but may, they may bring infections into their computers at work and those infected systems could attack our internal network. So we have to be always vigil about external threats and internal threats to our systems. Some of the security threats that we encounter are listed here. Viruses, worms, Trojan horses, spyware, adware, zero day attacks, hacker attacks, denial of service or DOS attacks, data interception and identity theft. And the list goes on and it's getting longer all the time. Some of the tools we use to stop this would be antivirus software, anti-spyware software, firewalls, sometimes dedicated firewalls. That's just an appliance, a little box you buy and plug into your network. And that would be a dedicated firewall versus a software firewall that you probably have on your Windows PC or on a server. We also, in routers and switches, create access control lists. That's a type of firewall that allows us to granularly control what traffic goes where. We also have intrusion prevention systems that scan your network in real time, and then they lock it down when they think the network's under attack. We also have VPNs, virtual private networks. These are encrypted tunnels that we can communicate across uh, without having to worry that someone's spying on what we're uh, what we're doing. So Cisco has some different um, network products or architectures. They have this idea called borderless networks, which is basically VPNs, allowing you to access your network uh, when you're outside the company walls. And that would be called borderless networks, but really it's just VPNs and firewalls. Um, they have data center virtualization technologies, and that's what we call cloud computing is the data center virtualization. And we also have collaboration and that's things like doing video conferencing. Cisco also has a bunch of certifications and you're um, probably in this class either going for an entry level certification, which would be the CSIN, Cisco Certified Entry Level Network Technician, or you might be going through all four of these courses and going for your CCNA, which is an associate level certification which is a, a great career um, certification to get. And you can move up from there to the professional expert or even the architect level. We're finally at the end. What you learned in this chapter was that networks and the internet have changed the way we communicate, learn, and work, even the way we play. You can see that when I go to restaurants, I see people eating and they're on their phones. I see people walking and they're on their phones. I see people using technology everywhere. 
And I didn't see that 10 years ago. This is a new, new thing. This really is not that old. If someone had been in a coma for 10 years, they would be shocked at how fast the world has changed. In 10 years, it's radically changed. We've never had that quick of a change in how we communicate, learn, work, and play. Our lives have changed dramatically because of the internet. It's not pl my place to say if that's uh, all good or bad. There are certainly aspects of that that are fantastic enabling people to work from home, uh, enabling new types of jobs and employability, and enabling a lot of people to start their own businesses. There have been some great things come out of the internet, but I think there's also some social problems, obviously. Some people have even suffered from internet addiction. We have new types of addictions because of the internet. Networks come in all sizes. They can be very small, simple networks of just one or two computers to networks interconnecting millions of devices like the internet. And the internet is the largest network in existence. In fact, the term simply means network of networks. The internet is not a thing, and the internet is just networks connected to other networks. There is no drawing of the internet, for instance. The internet is constantly changing and evolving. There is no way to know exactly what it is. There is no roadmap to the entire internet because it is changing and fluxing all the time. The network infrastructure is the platform that supports all of the cool things that we do with in-devices, intermediate devices, and our network cabling. And so what we're trying to do as network admins is provide a stable and reliable communication. Networks must be reliable if they're unreliable they don't really do us a job. Again, think of the automobile analogy. If your car is unreliable, it's really not going to be the go-to vehicle, right? You're like, ah, oh, I don't want to take my car. It's unreliable. I'd rather walk or take the bus or get a ride from a friend. You would question the further you had to go with that car, whether it was a good choice. If you had a reliable car, you could do more, go more places. A network is the same way. It's It's got to be reliable. And now it's got to be secure. Security is a new integral part of what we're doing. We have to lock it down and control it because of the threats that exist. And network infrastructure can vary greatly in terms of size, users, what it does. So a network isn't one thing. It's different things to different people. So when we build a network and design it, we have to start with the customer needs. We have to do a needs analysis and look at what is the customer, what is this business, what are they trying to do? Uh, maybe it's a home user, do they do gaming? Are they doing online shopping? What are the things they want to do with their network? And that is gonna drive the network we build and design. Because again, like an automobile, why are there so many different types of automobiles? Because the needs of the drivers are different. And so we have to build